Hey y'all, welcome back. Today we'll be doing some Science Olympiad Astronomy review. These questions are taken from the 24 Princeton University Science Olympiad exam. Uh, more information is available in the description below. Let's get into it. So here we have a problem where someone is observing a star with 1.4 solar luminosities in the year 2023. And then in the future, we note that the star uh, has a radius that doubles but and a temperature that decreases by 10%. Uh, we're going to compute the star's old flux to its new flux, uh, as seen on Earth, and in 100 million years, the relative distance between the star and Earth scarcely changes. Okay, so first we want to write out what f1 over f2 is. So in general, if we have this type of image, Earth, and then we have a star uh, orbiting at some distance d away, then our flux in general is going to be equal to luminosity over 4 pi d squared. Uh, and then that's our f1 on top, and now we write l2 over 4 pi d squared, and this is going to be equal to l1 over l2. Okay, so f1 over f2 is equal to l1 over l2, where l1 and l2 are the luminosity of the star uh, in the present, and then the luminosity of the star in the future. In the future, the star is going to look a little bit bigger. So if we want to be really specific, it might look like that, uh, two times the radius. Okay. So then to compute this, we need to know the Stefan-Boltzmann law. So Stefan-Boltzmann law uh, is going to be equal to 4 pi r star squared t star to the fourth multiplied by the Boltzmann constant. So then we can write this for both expressions. So then f1 over f2 uh, is going to be 4 pi r s1 squared t s1 to the fourth times the Boltzmann constant. And then same thing on the bottom. You guys get the idea uh fourth times the Boltzmann constant so evidently tons of variables go away here these terms and then this is our expression that we want to concern ourselves with so then f1 over f2 is equal to this expression so now let's go back to the problem so we're trying to compute the old flux to its new flux so its old flux we can leave um we're going to leave it as just l1 we're given 1.4 solar luminosities but we can do everything in variables here so we can just write this as one luminosity. And now let's consider our old, uh, our new flux. So the radius doubles, so that's going to be uh, 2r uh, to the squared. If we want to be very detailed, we could write this as um, r1 squared t1 to the fourth. So then our radius doubles here. And then our temperature decreases by 10%. So that's going to mean that we're going to have 0.9 t to the fourth. So now we just need to compute what this is. It's a simple variable. Um, so the r1 and the r1 squared and t1 to the fourth are going to cancel. And so we're going to left with uh, this expression in our calculator. So um, it'll basically be 1 squared times 0 0.9 to the fourth is our answer. Uh, once you cancel out these variables, and that's going to give you 0 0.38, um, the ratio of the fluxes, which is answer A. Okay, next question. Um, so we have uh, an interstellar travel is developed and we're gonna approach an exoplanet with this name. Um, the planet's albedo is 0 0.2, its orbital distance is 0 0.7 AU, and its luminosity is 1.1 solar luminosities. So we need to calculate the temperature of the exoplanet. So if we're gonna draw the image, we have some star uh, here and an exoplanet E here. We're naming it like that and it's orbiting at some distance d away. So there's an equation that um, some of you may have memorized for the system, but we're going to derive it really quickly. So it's basically when we're determining the temperature of an exoplanet, we need to consider the power into the system and the power out of the system. The power into the system comes from the star. So that's going to be the flux per square meter at this orbital distance multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the, this is not could be confused with pressure, this is power, uh, multiplied by the area of the uh, exoplanet that's receiving the light. And so that area is actually the cross-sectional area of the exoplanet. And so we write that as pi r planet squared. Okay, so then Pn is the flux. Um, for flux, we're going to write it in terms of luminosity over 4 pi d squared, as we did in our previous step. Then we're going to multiply it by pi r p squared. Um, now, an important thing is that the albedo is 0 0.2. Um, albedo is a measure of albedo 
is a measure of reflected light over incident light. So that means that this is the light that is going away. So the light that we absorb, uh, absorbed light, is going to be proportional to 1 minus the albedo. So this is the coefficient we need to think of when we're thinking of light that's being absorbed. So then our Pn right here should really be 1 minus A. Um, okay, so that's our power in. And now we need to equate it to power out. Um, these two values must be equal to each other, conservation of energy. So then power out, we assume that the exoplanet radiates all of its light away as a black body. And so we can write Stefan Boltzmann's law again for pi r p squared, t p to the fourth times the Boltzmann constant. And so here we see that uh, these r p terms, pi r p terms, will cancel, which is a little interesting there. So let's let's make all this a little bit smaller, so that we have more room to work with. Okay. So then, equating these two uh, variable expressions, we have l over four pi d squared pi r p squared 1 minus a is equal to 4 pi r p squared t p to the fourth Boltzmann constant. Okay, so now let's see what cancels out here. So pi r p goes away on both of these expressions. Um, otherwise, that looks like everything else is there as is. So then, yeah, we can write this then as t p to the fourth this is the planetary, the temperature of the exoplanet, I should have specified that, um, is going to be equal to L1 minus A over 4 pi d squared, Boltzmann constant. We have another 4 right here, so let's make this a 16. And so this is the equation of planetary equilibrium temperature right here. So now let's plug these terms into our calculator. Um, so we're given our values, let's, let's do it in meters because our answer is in Kelvin. So... There we go. And so if we're going to plug this into our calculator, we have, let's see, luminosity of 1.1. So then 1.1 times 3.826 times 10 to the 26. This is the luminosity of the suns um, in watts over meters squared. Or no, in watts, but uh, we'll leave that as is. 1 minus 0 0.2. That's based off the planet's albedo. Uh, and then we're going to divide this by 16 pi. Let's see how far away we are. We are 0 0.7 AU. So then we can do 0 0.7 times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th meters. That's what 1 AU is, and then Boltzmann constant. Um, we don't really need the meters units since we're dealing with coefficients right now. Uh, okay, so let's see what this works out to be uh, using our calculator divided by 16 pi times 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. This Boltzmann constant, by the way. 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. It has some watt units that uh, we'll specify later. Um, and then 0.7 times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th squared raised to the 4th. Okay, so if you do this computation right here, uh, my calculator just gave me a value of 321 Kelvin. Uh, so we took this quantity right here. Uh, we plugged it into a calculator where this is the 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8. And then we took it to the fourth root. So you want to take it to the fourth root to solve for it, the temperature of the planet. And so let's see if that's an option. So I got 321 Kelvin. 323 Kelvin is pretty dang close. Depends on what values you use. Um, you might use something a little different for this value or a little different from this value. Um, but that's how you approach the problem. So your answer is B. Okay, next question. So what is the maximum eccentricity of a planet to ensure the planet is always in the habitable zone? The habitable zone is defined as where water is always liquid. So since we're doing physics, we're going to think in terms of SI units. And this definition comes about from uh, T min is uh, 0 Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. Uh, this is the value we should be using in SI units. And then T max is going to be 100 Celsius, which is 373 Kelvin. OK, so we have these two uh, temperature ranges. And now let's draw a quick picture of what's going on. So we have a star right here, and then we might have an ellipse that looks something like this. And so uh, here is the closest distance to the star, defined as perihelion. You might think it's distance distance right here, but that's just because I drew a terrible ellipse. Um, perihelion is our definition of closest, and then aphelion is our definition of farthest. And so naturally, since temperature seems to be somehow related to distance, we'll think about that in a second. 
Um, this is going to be your highest temperature, 373 Kelvin. This will be your lowest temperature, 273 Kelvin. Okay, so we have two definitions there. Um, and now let's think about what distance looks like. So the distance is going to be a function of uh, perihelion. Let's write P is equal to A times 1 plus uh, 1 minus E. So this is what the definition of uh, perihelion is. Um, this is your semi-major axis, and then this is your eccentricity right here. Similarly, uh, A philion, uh, let's just write that, I guess, is equal to A times 1 plus E. So these are the distances uh, at these two points um, based upon the semi-major axis and then the eccentricity. So you might be tempted to quickly just write a quick ratio and solve the problem 373 over 273 is equal to maybe, I don't know, peri over aphelion, but that basically just overlooks any form of fundamental physics. That's a bad guess. Um, a better way to go about this problem is to think about what we just solved in the previous question, um, looking at this work, and how we have the equation for planetary equilibrium temperature right here. So this equation tells us that uh, Tp to the fourth is equal to luminosity 1 minus the albedo, divided by 16 pi d squared, the Boltzmann constant. Okay, so it looks like right here we have some of this information. We have temperature right here, and then we have some form of distance right here. Um, immediately, since we're comparing two different types of the times in the orbit, uh, we should consider what variables are constant here. And luminosity is going to be constant. Uh, 1 minus a is going to be constant because it's the albedo of the planet. Um, 16 pi and Boltzmann constant are all constant. So then uh, what we have here is that Tp squared is proportional to 1 over d, um, taking the square root of this equation right here. So this is the relationship we want to use. So now uh, it looks like we're almost done. Um, let's quickly uh, minimize some of this so we get a little more writing room. Okay, so now let's consider uh, T. I'm going to write Tp and Ta. So then T, this is this time perihelion. Uh, square, let's do T peri over T aphelion is going to be equal to 1 over dp over 1 over dA, which is equal to dA over dp. And we should square this term real quick. Let's not forget the square. That's pretty important. So this is our equation that we're going to be using uh, to solve this problem. So let's like move it there or something like that. Uh, this is pretty messy. Sorry about that. But Math is still there, math is still there. Okay, so now this is the equation we're gonna use. So then we're gonna have, uh, let's see, let's draw a little arrow, and we have T perihelion is 373 Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin divided by 273 Kelvin squared, and we're gonna set it equal to dA over dP. So dA, the aphelion, is defined as A times one plus E, and then we're gonna divide that by A times one minus E. Now, fortunately, these terms go away, and uh, this is a variable, equation of one variable. So let's briefly solve the equation. Um, you'll get that 1.866, don't forget the square, I sometimes forget it, is 1 plus e over 1 minus e. And now you can solve this equation algebraically by distributing 1 minus e here. Um, but when you do that, you'll get that your eccentricity is 0 0.302 which is the correct answer. Um, so that's how you solve this problem. It's a little fun fact to memorize because anytime your eccentricity is greater than that, uh, your planet will have some periods where water is going to be completely frozen over. Um, of course, this uh, it neglects things like the atmosphere, um, which adds another layer of complexity, but it's a fun little thought experiment. Okay, this is the final question, and it's a pretty simple question at that. Um, we want the gravitational force and potential energy of the following two mass system. Uh, given this mass, this mass, and then the distance between the two bodies. So quickly, gravitational force is going to be uh, g m1 over m2 r squared. We're not including a negative sign or anything considering the vector because all the answer choices are positive. We just want the magnitude of that, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and then to help you guys with the dimensional analysis, this is going to be uh, g m1 and m2 are both in units of solar masses, so we can actually write this as mass of the sun squared times 1.15 times 0 
Um, that's another way to rewrite this expression. Um, you guys can figure that out. That's pretty basic dimensional analysis. And then this is going to be over 3.9 times 1.5 times 10 to 11th meters uh, squared. Okay, so that'll give you your gravitational force. And when you do that computation, I believe that you will get uh, either this value in newtons or this value in newtons. So you have two answer choices. You notice how this one is negative and this one is positive. So that tells you um, one aspect of potential energy uh, is what is the definition of potential energy. So since gravity is an attractive force, we actually define potential energy to be negative gm1 m2 over r. And so uh, you could actually just uh, multiply your answer by one of the r's right here to get the final answer, but we know that it's going to be negative in magnitude. So it's going to be answer c because gravitational potential energy is negative due to it being an attractive force uh, of fg. But if you wanted to write this out again, it would be pretty much identical to your last one. 1.5, 0 0.08, divided by 3.9 times 1.5 times 10 to the 11th uh, meters, and that's it. And so this is going to be your answer of the potential energy, which is going to be this answer choice. Um, very straightforward question, just really testing the most basic knowledge of what is gravitational force and what is the definition of potential energy. Uh, thank you all for watching. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below. Thanks.